Here, Rita Dove, the Pulitzer Prize winning former Poet Laureate for the United States reads a sample of her work spanning a period of almost 40 years. This video was recorded April 1, 2016 during the 13th National Black Writers Conference. The conference is hosted by the Center for Black Literature at Mega Evers College in Brooklyn, New York. The conference is the only one of its kind in the United States and AALBC.com has been a program supporter and steering committee member for over a decade. If you enjoyed this video, please support us by sharing it with others and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Enjoy Mrs. Dove's poetry reading. So I am really thrilled to be here tonight and I uh, wanted to read to you a few poems along my journey. Uh, before we get into a conversation here. I'm going to start with a poem that is a very early poem. It comes from um, my very first book of poems. And it's a story inspired by slave narratives, because this was one of those ways in which we could get our stories told, and that they had to be told in a certain kind of rubric a certain dispassionate voice so as not to upset the delicate, the delicate natures of those who are going to read them. And that, <coughs> that sense, plus, and how that rolls down through the years into nonviolence and into trying to take the high road, whatever that might be, is what uh, permeated these poems. This poem is called Kentucky, 1833. It is Sunday, day of rough housing. We are let out in the woods. The young boys wrestle and butt their heads together like sheep. A circle forms, claps, and shouts fill the air. The women, brown and glossy, gather round the banjo player or simply lie in the sun, legs and aprons folded. The weather's an odd monkey. Any other day he's on our back, his cotton eye everywhere. Today the light sifts down like the finest cornmeal, coating our hands and arms with a dust. God's dust, old woman Acker says. She's the only one who could read to us from the Bible before Massa forbade it. On Sundays, something hangs in the air. A hallelujah, a skitter of grass but we can't call it by name, and it disappears. <coughs> then Mass and his gentleman friends come to bet on the boys. They guffaw and shout, taking sides, red-faced on the edge of the boxing ring. There is more kicking, butting, and scuffling. The winner gets a dram of whiskey if he can drink it all in one swig without choking. Jason is bucking and prancing about. Massa said his name reminded him of some sailor, a hero who crossed an ocean looking for a golden cotton field. Jason thinks he's been born to great things, a suit with gold threads, vest and all. Now the winner is sprawled out under a tree, and the sun, that weary tambourine, hesitates at the rim of the sky's green light. It's a crazy feeling that carries through the night as if the sky were an omen we could not understand, the book that, if we could read, would change our lives. Mm. Thank you. I've been, I'm, I'm reading from a book which is not out <coughs> yet, though all the poems are out there uh, in separate books. This is a collective poems. Uh, from 1974 to 2004, which makes me, I don't know, 30 years. I'm like, what happened? I don't know where they went. But um, this next poem, Canary. As we know, Canary is the female vocalist in a jazz group, in any kind of jazz group. It's also the bird that you test uh, gas leaks with in the mines. You take them down, and if they die, you know the mines are not safe for men. And this poem is of <clears throat> about Billie Holiday, but it's dedicated to a different kind of um, forebear, uh, Michael Harper, who I know both of the gentlemen have had quite a bit of dealings with, and I have to, he has touched us all 
and, and set this on our way. He's a wonderful man. And a wonderful, complicated poet. Canary, for Michael S. Harper. Billy Holiday's burned voice had as many shadows as lights. A mournful candelabra against the sleek piano, the gardenia her signature under that ruined face. Now you're cooking, drummer to bass, magic spoon, magic needle. Take all day if you have to with your mirror and your bracelet of song. Fact is, the invention of women under siege has been to sharpen love in the service of myth. If you can't be free, be a mystery. The island women of Paris skim from curb to curb like regatta. From Pont Neuf to the Quai de la Hop in cool negotiation with traffic, each a country to herself transposed to the city by a fluke called imperial courtesy. The island women glide past held aloft by a wire running straight to heaven. Who can ignore their ornamental bearing? Turbans haughty as parrots, or deft braids carved into airy cages, transfixed on their manifest grounds. The island women move through Paris as if they had just finished inventing their destinations. Hmm. It's better not to get in their way, and better not look an island woman in the eye, <laughs> unless you like feeling unnecessary. <laughs> because I was inspired by um, Alpha's poem um, to talk about that legacy. It's called Freedom Ride. As if after High Street and the left turn onto Exchange, the view would veer onto someplace fresh, Curacao or a mosque adrift on a milk-fed pond. But there's just more cloud cover and germy air condensing on the tinted glass and the little houses with their fearful patches of yard rushing into the flames. Pull the cord a stop too soon and you'll find yourself walking a gauntlet of stairs. Daydream and you'll wake up in the stale dark of a cinema, Dallas playing its mistake over and over until even that sad reel won't stay stuck. There's still Bobby and Malcolm and Memphis at every corner the same scorched brick darkened windows. Make no mistake, there's fire back where you came from too. Pick any stop. You can ride into the afternoon singing with strangers or rush home to the scotch you've been pouring all day. But where you sit is where you'll be when the fire hits. Mm -hmm. <laughs> every, every city has its exchange street. That exchange street, High Street onto Exchange, was my personal one from Akron, Ohio, which was, of course, Rowan's reference to <laughs> LeBron. I'll tell you a story about that. Rosa. How she sat there. The time right inside a place so long 
it was ready. That trim name with its dream of a bench to rest on. Her sensible coat. Doing nothing was doing. The clean frame of her gaze carved by a camera flash. How she stood up when they bent down to retrieve her purse. That courtesy. And, um, Daniel arrives at the Coconut Grove late. An aqua and ermine, gardenia scaling her left sleeve in a spasm of scent, her gloves white, her smile chastened, purse giddy with stars and rhinestones clipped to her brilliant pink hair, on her free arm that fine Negro, Mr. Wonderful Smith. It's the day that isn't, February 29th at the end of the shortest month of the year, and the shittiest too. <laughs> Everywhere except Hollywood, California, where the maid can still wear mink and still be a maid, bobbing her bandaged head and cursing the white folks under her breath as she smiles and shoes their silly daughters in from the night dew. What can she be thinking of, striding into the ballroom where no black face has ever showed itself except above a serving tray? I had Hattie, Mama Mac, her haughtiness, the little lady from Showboat whose name Bing forgot, Beulah and Bertha and Melina and Carrie and Violet and Cynthia and Fidelia, one half of the dark Barrymores. Dear Mammy, we can't help but hug you, crawl into your generous lap, tease you with arch innuendo so we can feel that much more wicked and youthful and sleek. But oh, what we forgot. The four husbands, the phantom pregnancy, your famous parties, your celebrated icebox cake. Your giggle above the red petticoats rustle, black girl and white girl walking hand in hand down the railroad tracks in Kansas City six years ago. The man who advised you now that you were famous to begin eliminating your more common acquaintances and your reply, catching him square in the eye. That's a good idea. I'll start right now by eliminating you. <laughs> is she or isn't she? Three million dishes, a truckload of aprons and head rags later, and here you are, poised between husbands and factions, no corset wide enough to hold you in, your huge face, a dark moon, split by that spontaneous smile, your trademark, your curse. No matter, Hattie. It's a long, beautiful walk into that flower-smothered standing ovation. So go on and make them. <coughs> to keep that conversation going, uh, that long journey going, I went back uh, for my most recent book called Sonata Mulatica, which I mentioned. I went back to the 19th and 18th century where there was a mixed race violinist by the name of George Bridgetower, who, um, who was famous in his day and for whom Beethoven actually composed a sonata. And I wanted to unearth that story because it had gone forgotten. And in doing so, hit upon something that no one really knew had happened. When he was 10 years old, nine to 10 years old, his father took him on the road and they were in Paris, the year 1789. If you remember your history, it was not a good year to be in Paris. The revolution was starting. Uh, but um, he played this concert, and in this concert there was someone in the audience who has <coughs> since proven was indeed in the audience, one of them at least. Uh, and, uh, well, you'll see what doesn't happen. The notion that the carriage wheels clattering through Paris remind him of the drums from the islands in his father's tales. Click, clack, sputter, whir. He could make a song of it, dance this foreign hand down the cobbles of the Rue de Bac as he balances his small weight against the pricking cushions. Clack, sputter, whir. All the cadences jumbled together except the thudding dirge of his heart. 
that he can see in curtained twilight. The violent case in his lap twitch with every jounce like an animal trapped under the hunter's eye. That he can sense down shrouded alleys, danger rustling just as surely as he can feel spring's careless fingers feathering his chest and smell April's ferment in the stink of the poor marching toward him. Though none of this is true, he hears nothing but clatter. He can't see the rain-slicked arc of the bridge passing under him as the pale stone of the palace rears up, and he climbs down to be whisked into the massive salle de machine, his father's cloak folded back like a bat <coughs> tucked wing, because it was a dry spring that year on the continent. Nonetheless, he ignores heart studding and steps out onto the flickering stage, deep and treacherous as a lake still frozen at sunset, aglow with reflected light. Soon the music will take him across. He'll feel each string's ecstasy thrum in his head and only then dare to open his eyes to gaze past the footlights at the rows of powdered curls. Let's see the toy bear jump his hoops. Nodding, lorgnettes poised, not hearing, but judging. Except for that tall man on the aisle, with hair of orange of fading leaves, and the two girls beside him, one a younger composition of snow and embers, but the other, all the other, dark, dark yet warm as the violin's nut-brown sheen. Miraculous creature who fastens her solemn black gaze on the boy as if to say, you are what I am, what I yearn to be, so that he plays only for her and not her keepers. And when he is finally free to stare back, applause rippling over the ramparts. Even then, she does not smile. Here, Rita Dove, the Pulitzer Prize winning former poet laureate for the United States reads a sample of her work spanning a period of almost 40 years. This video was recorded April 1, 2016 during the 13th National Black Writers Conference. The conference is hosted by the Center for Black Literature at Mega Evers College in Brooklyn, New York. The conference is the only one of its kind in the United States and AALBC.com has been a program supporter and steering committee member for over a decade. If you enjoyed this video, please support us by sharing it with others and subscribing to our YouTube channel. Enjoy Mrs. Dove's poetry reading.